Hello, we're now going to talk about state feedback. So state feedback is probably one of the first concrete examples of a state space technique giving extra insight. So most of the things we've talked about so far have been things like relating poles to properties of state space models and um, zeros and talking about equivalence of transfer functions and this it's all been sort of about establishing that in some respects or trying to understand some of the things from transfer functions in terms of state space. It's not contributed anything new to our understanding yet um, but that's about to change and it's going to change through state feedback and more significantly it's going to change when we actually combine state feedback and observers to give a kind of a very nice and complete um, control system design method. Um, so state feedback is, is not a control is not a controller design technique on its own. You, you need to couple it with observers and I'll explain why uh, when we get there. Um, and the state feedback technique I'm going to be talking about is pole placement. And so hopefully you've covered this in the basic course. And we're just going to talk in a little bit more about in a little bit more detail about uh, pole placement and in particular why state feedback can place closed loop poles absolutely anywhere. I'm sure this is something that you've heard and you've probably done plenty of calculations where you have placed poles wherever you've been told to place poles, but we'll try to understand why in fact you can place them wherever you want using our controllable canonical form. Um, so Oh yeah, we've got some uh, state space model. We're not going to write down the why the equation for why. Not going to need it. Um, oh well, let's do it uh, anyway. So y is equal to cx. So let's do it because we're not going to add the direct term. It doesn't matter for state feedback, but it will start to matter when we um, include our observer. Um, it's no great issue. First of all. Uh, Having no direct term in the the process is essentially without loss of generality. All reasonable processes will have no direct term. Um, and also, you can modify this whole method to account for it. It just makes everything a bit messier. So we'll just not add a d uh, for a simple life. And so what we have, this is our state space description. We also have our transfer function description. Let's just say that the transfer function description of this model is b1 s to the n minus 1 plus b2 s to the n minus 2 and so on plus b n all over s to the n plus a1 s to the n minus 1 and so on. So state space model, this is its transfer function. Um, state feedback is a way of introducing a particular um, control input that will change the location of the poles of this system. And uh, as I'm sure you remember, we do it by setting u is equal to minus something multiplied by the state. And if we were to implement this in practice, that would imply that we would measure the state x and decide what our control input u is in response to that measurement. And the way we decide is governed by the matrix that we put here. Um, this is why state feedback on its own can't really often be used. Um, it's very rare that this C matrix is the identity matrix. So it's very rare that the thing that you measure, your output, corresponds to the state of your system. Um, so this is something you often can't apply in practice, but as you'll see um, when we combine this with an observer, we can still use the state feedback uh, pole placement technique. So what goes in here? Well, here we put a matrix. I'm going to do something very confusing for you, I'm afraid. I'm going to put matrix K in here. Uh, this goes against the Lund convention, which is to call the state feedback matrix L and uh, correspondingly the observer matrix K. I am fairly confident that the Lund convention is unique in global terms for having things this way round. Almost the rest, I would say, maybe there are some other examples, but the overwhelming majority of other 
universities, uh, companies, whatever, worldwide, will call the state feedback matrix K and the observer matrix L uh, rather than the other way around. So I'm going to call it K because that's how I was taught. And if I don't call it K, I'm going to accidentally start calling it K at some point and it's going to make a big mess. The real message here is it doesn't matter what you call it. It's just a matrix of numbers. I'm going to call it K. You can call it L. It's going to be L um, in the slides. It's L throughout the lecture notes of the basic course. Just uh, You're probably used to things kind of having random names or names that change. I just want to really flag this up um, now um, in, in case it causes any confusion. So this is our state feedback law. And what does it do? Well, it changes the poles. And what are the poles? Well, the poles are the location of the um, eigenvalues. And how does it do it? Well, if I just substitute u is equal to minus kx into this equation, we only need to look at the top equation. We get that x dot is equal to a minus bk multiplied by x. And so we get so closed loop poles or eigenvalues um, correspond to the eigenvalues of this matrix here. And what state feedback lets you do is by picking k in appropriate way, you change what this matrix is, different, putting different numbers into k changes what this, num this matrix is, and this changes where the eigenvalues are. And pole placement works by choosing those entries in such a way that the eigenvalues end up where you want them to be. Um, and I made a video about this uh, a while ago. It's, uh, I'll, I'll attach it in just in case you're interested in reviewing the actual process of pole placement. Um, I think it's pretty well covered in the basic course. So we're not going to do an example of placing poles somewhere. We'll give another video to do this. But what we're going to do now is talk about why state feedback does let you place the poles wherever you want. Um, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to appeal to our friend the controllable canonical form. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new variable. I'm going to put it here. We're going to introduce a coordinate transform z is equal to tx. And we're going to pick t in such a way that our state space model gets put into its controllable canonical form. It's not actually important what this matrix T is. We're not going to say what it is, but we know we can always do it. Um, so we do this coordinate transformation, and our, in our new coordinates, our model becomes Z dot is equal to, and then we get this nice structure in the A matrix, minus A1 minus A2 up to minus a n, and then here I've got 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So I've got this sort of diagonal of 1s, and I've got zeros everywhere else. And here I have z, and here I have 1, 0, 0, 0. And this is multiplied by my input u, not going to put it in yet. Um, and here we've got y, and here I've got b1, b2, and so on. That's multiplied by z. And what are these a's and what are these b's? These are just the a's and b's in the numerator and denominator polynomials associated with the transfer function of our state space model. So it's going to always be done. Because this has a transfer function, we can just find out what that transfer function is and then fill out the thing in controllable canonical form. This corresponds to some coordinate transform. The system we end up with has an A matrix of exactly the same size. So there must be some invertible transform that takes us between the two. And so this is where u is. I'm not going to put it in. I'm going to put in k bar 1, k bar 2, k bar 3, so on up to k bar n, all multiplied by z. So what is this? This is our state feedback. Yeah, there should be a minus sign. These should all be minuses, so let's make that a minus sign. Um, this is our state feedback written in the coordinate z. So we could just substitute x is equal to t inverse times z, and we get a state feedback written in our state transformed coordinates z. 
again, we, we know we can do this. And, in, and, and also we know that we can always go back to this description just by multiplying um, back in this T matrix. So it's completely equivalent to work in terms of K bar. We know for any K bar, any state feedback K bar written on Z, there is a corresponding one K on X. But what's, uh, what's good about this? Well, the good thing is that we, well, we can simplify this expression. Um, maybe we should do it down here. So if we simplify this expression, what do we get? We get that Z dot, and now everything just depends on Z, in the same way that here, after doing our state feedback, we just got some matrix and then X. But what goes into this matrix? And I've not given myself much extra space. Well, in this corner, where we've got minus A1, minus 1 times K1 bar. What do we have here? We have minus A2, minus K2 bar, and so on. OK, so all of the top row, we just subtract the corresponding K values. What about the rest of the matrix? Well, this is all zeros here. So if I multiply this out, this matrix is all zeros in this lower block. So I add nothing onto here. And so I get 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. So I get something that's still in uh, my controllable canonical form. And in particular, what this means is that the closed loop system, the closed loop transfer function, um, will have transfer function. Well, we get the numerator from this one. That hasn't changed. So we've got b1s to the n minus 1 plus so on. But in the denominator, Critically, we've got s to the n plus a1 plus k1 s to the n minus 1. So this determines the corresponding entry here, and so on. k2 s to the n minus 2, and so on. So what does this mean? Well, these should all be bars, of course. Um, well, this means that through an appropriate choice of my state feedback, K bar, I'm able to make all of these coefficients equal whatever I want them to equal to, be equal to. So that means I'm able to make the denominator polynomial equal to whatever I want. And that's actually the same as saying I can place the poles wherever I want. So for example, suppose I want, suppose my system's second order and I want the poles P1 and p2. Well, if I multiply this out, I get s squared minus p1 plus p2 s plus p1 p2. So whatever choice of poles I want will just correspond to some polynomial with particular coefficients. This s will never will always just be an s to the n depending on the order. And that means that because any choice of poles just corresponds to changing what these coefficients are, if I'm able to change those coefficients to be whatever I want, then I can place the poles wherever I want. And so what we see from all of this is that through the uh, controllable canonical form, we can understand why state feedback gives us the flexibility to place poles wherever we want. And, and that's sort of the point of all of this. And then. Uh, of course, you've learned how to go and actually do that in practice. And um, this isn't a practical design method yet. You can't measure the system state. But in conjunction with an observer, which we'll now talk about, you, you, can, um, you can implement this, uh, a, a controller based on these ideas. And that's what we're going to do next.